Welcome to Travel Worth Living, a travel podcast helping to share stories that matter from around the world. My name is Seth, and I'll be your host today as we talk with an urban explorer who actually does a lot of rural and urban exploration. Anywhere that is an abandoned location, Greg is there. Originally from Poland, Greg is currently living in China, where he uses every available opportunity to seek out these abandoned locations to capture some of the most epic pictures. During our conversation, he tells so many stories, including uh, his 10-hour interrogation by the Chinese authorities, his backpacking trip into a remote part of Kazakhstan where Russia uh, launches their, their rockets, uh, and why he is so passionate about urban exploration. He really dives into um, kind of his uh, his moral code, his code of ethics behind the whole urbex community, and why sometimes they are misrepresented and not always understood, uh, but they are still an integral part to maintaining a historical record of some of these locations. So fascinating conversation. Um, I'm not in the urbex community, so I found it particularly intriguing uh, being able to talk with Greg and learn more about the community. Um, and just the stories he tells and the places he's been and the adventures he's been on is absolutely incredible. So I know you're going to love this episode. Uh, if you're not subscribed to our mailing list, go ahead and visit TravelWorthLiving.com. Uh, you can subscribe to our newsletter and get regular updates on what's happening with the podcast. And be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel. All right, here is my conversation with Greg. Greg, thanks so much for coming on the Travel Worth Living podcast. Super excited to have you on and chat about all your many adventures. Hey, man. Yes, I am super excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So let's go ahead and start by telling uh, my audience what exactly it is you do uh, and, and what takes you all over the world on so many adventures. Uh, to say it really simply, I go to abandoned places. I go to, but you see, the thing is like, when you say this, it sounds so, so weird. And only when you see the, like when you see the, when you see the pictures, you realize, oh my God, some of those places are like, it could be really beautiful. So what I try to do is I really try to find the most remarkable abandoned places that you can think of. I want you to look at my picture and say, wow, where is this? And those are the sort of like reactions that I get. And um, that's kind of like what I do. It's not art. <laughs> let's just let's let's get this clear. Like it's not art, uh, but but I kind of just uh, seek the adventure in that way. And there's there's two different names, correct? Because I'm actually very unfamiliar with this this whole world. There's um, urbex and then bandos, is that correct? What what's okay, kind so of like, the terminology? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me let me let me tell you. So like uh, for normally this is like um, urban exploring. So urban exploring would be obviously like you going to exploring a cities, like you going on top of the rooftops, um, abandoned places different like exploring a city would be called like urban exploring right so now you have a bit of a subcategory with the urban exploring called urbex and urbex is basically abandoned places you go to abandoned places now the the places in the community there's a whole community uh, about abandoned places urbex community uh, we have this little bit of a like a slang uh, we call the places bandos. That's why my podcast is called Chasing Bandos, because we are constantly trying to find new locations. Got you. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I've, I've done a little bit. Actually, my wife and I, our first date was uh, in an abandoned factory. Amazing, amazing location. We were able to climb up and, and watch the stars at night. It was beautiful. But uh that's probably my my biggest foray into this whole world uh, was exploring that one factory in our in our town there, um, and it's addicting. Like you know, going into these places and and realizing that at one point people used to live there, and and at one point people used to you know um, work or or just be there, and so discovering that um, it it can be quite quite uh, addicting. And so, yeah, following your stuff and listening to your podcast has been very informative to me as to this whole community that exists. So I kind of want to start by how did you get into this? Like, 
what what started this uh, urban exploration journey for you? Um, I got divorced, <laughs> and <laughs> and I decided to go to Chernobyl. That's how I started. <laughs> <laughs> That's the short, shortest story ever. Do you want me to elaborate on that one? That, that is quite <laughs> hilarious. Um, yeah, a little elaboration would be fantastic. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, it's funny that because like I don't, I don't know how to talk. I don't know how to s tell story in the short term. I always my stories are always super long. But okay, I'll I'll try to be that. consistent here. Um, Essentially, what happened is I was living this life. I was a teacher uh, living in London and math teacher. Um, I'm probably your least, uh, least typical math teacher. But anyway, I was living this life. I was pretty content. I was just living like a kind of like a day to day life. You know, uh, bought an apartment. I thought that would be it. Um, uh, watching football, playing video games, that kind of stuff. Just just kind of regular day to day and um and my my wife and i we uh, uh, you know like uh, things happen <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> let's just say and 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 after and i was but i was always super intrigued about the um like the post apocalyptic post apocalyptic themes um i would always um have this like um they would mesmerize me the places, you know, like some sort of like, you know, the movies like Book of Eli or Mad Max or mm -hmm. like the book by Cormac McCarthy, The Road, they would drive my imagination to this like uh, unreal new place. So I would be the guy who would be obviously watching other people going somewhere or I would be watching the pictures, uh, looking at the pictures and, and, and liking the pictures. And, and when, when I got divorced, I just... I just thought to myself, like, I need to do something else. Um, I had this one friend who I met him, like, when this was happening in my life. And I remember when we when we met, he was my neighbor. We added each other on Facebook and stuff. And, and I remember this uh, first impression when I added him on Facebook and I saw his pictures. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I had this, like, a... Uh, you know, like between the guys, like you can say things like this. I said to him, like, dude, like what happened to you? Like, because he looked so handsome on on those pictures. But the person that I saw in real life, it was like a wreck, wreck of yeah. a man. And he he told me his story that he got divorced. He turned into like drinking and, and weed and stuff. And and he just like lost it. Mm -hmm. And. So there was many different circumstances in my life that happened around that time where I realized, wow, like I cannot turn into this guy. Like I have to do something else. I have to turn this not a positive thing into something positive. Anything in our lives that we have, you can find something positive. And instead of feeling sorry for yourself, I decided, well, what the heck, let me find someone who's as crazy as me and let's go to Chernobyl because I, I, I love that place. I, I, there's something about that place that I, I, I thought to myself like, wow, I just want to walk in there like the ghost town. I want to walk, experience this. And lucky enough, there was a guy from my work um, that was crazy enough to go with me and we went and I never looked back after that. Wow. That's, that's powerful. I, I love, I love what you did there because you know, you, you said, I'm not going to be a victim of circumstances. I'm going to change my life and use this really terrible, sucky situation to create a whole new life for myself. And what you've done is incredible. I mean, just looking through some of the pictures that you've taken, some of the places that you've been. Um, but I'm curious. So starting with Chernobyl, because right now you're actually doing, uh, how many part series on your podcast? I think it's up to eight now. Yes. So there's eight, there will be 10. Uh, okay. I'm not technically, uh, so the idea always was to do uh, a, a 10 episodes, like a, I'm doing like a Chernobyl mini series. Um, but it all depends on the guests that I managed to find. Uh, so like in the future, if there are, uh, if I find like interesting people somehow involved with Chernobyl, I will interview them, but I will stop after, after 10 now and, 
I will be moving on to a, a different mini series. Because essentially, if I may, I, I interview um, people like me, other explorers, but at the same time, I also do um, like a mini series. So like I did the Chernobyl mini series, I will be doing North Korea a mini series, and I will be doing um, a place called uh, Baikonur Cosmodrome, because um, in the in the community, in the urbex world, there is one place that we called a uh, Holy Grail, uh, which is um, in, in Kazakhstan. Really? There is there is a desert. There is a desert, and inside this desert, um, Russia actually leases the um, the land from Kazakhstan, and this is where Russians send rockets to space, and. They used they they had they is so it's a military base, and they they had it for ages, um, and back in where this you know in so, during the Soviet Union when there was a, a, a um, the race to put yeah the first space person race. on to the to the space race right um, they had this program when they developed their own space shuttle called Buran. But after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, on the edge of this base, there is this hangar where there are two space shuttles still there. But they, the program died, so they just left it. So there are two abandoned space shuttles sitting there on the edge of the base, and there's another hangar with a rocket. And this is a bit of a mission to get there. Uh, and I must say, this was the craziest thing I've ever done in my life. But because of this, I wanted to also interview other people who've done it. Uh, because the story of this, it, it, you can imagine that that takes a whole podcast, uh, or one episode to tell this story, because it is like nothing else. I've, I've, I've since and I've never done anything like that uh, before and, and after that so um, this is something like like my biggest achievement in my life actually <laughs> yeah wow um, I know we probably haven't don't have time to cover the whole thing mm. like you said it would take an entire podcast but I'm really curious uh, to dive in a little bit to that to that trip um, you said it's the holy gra grail basically because you know I mean just crazy that two space shuttles, a rocket, like abandoned in the middle of the desert. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that really stands out about it? Or is it just the the significance, the historical significance? Or is it like difficult to reach as well? It's so it's extremely difficult hike uh, because you're going through the desert um, and it's 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 40 kilometers one way, 40 kilometers back. Um, you have wow. to have yeah, so you have to, on, you see, the hike, what I want people to understand is, um, and when people say, like, well, it's a hike, but it's the bag, the bag filled with your equipment and the water, because if you want to yep. do it right, you at least need to spend two days on the site. Um, because if you want to do it right, you can only move at night, because this is a, a life military based base it, and there are russians there <laughs> with so, guns. You're, so you're technically <laughs> so not even supposed to be there no 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 you're not supposed to be there this is an active base they are still sending rockets to space from that space it's oh, just man. this the base is huge so yeah. on the edge of it that there are they put those rockets be, because they don't use those hangars anymore and it's yeah. always rusty since like 1980s um so this whole hangar is collapsing like the the windows are you know uh, destroyed like there's so much sound inside it's a it's a, it's a paradox like it's a, such a quiet place but at the same time you hear every little hiss of the wind of the wind so um it, it's very dangerous it's it's uh, it's a physical. Um, you you have to really prepare. I prepare three months. I pack my bag every Friday night. I would go around my city and I walk all night. Mm. I left at eight p.m. and I get home at five a.m. I would walk all night because I needed to prepare myself for this trip um, physically 
and I needed to get I, I needed to be okay with uh, like wearing this bag for such a long time yeah. and also train myself to drink as least uh, amount of water as, as I can because obviously then I have to then I, I can take less water yeah. Um, and yeah so uh, it is and obviously like you don't want to get caught in there so um, it is it is something that's uh, really really dangerous and difficult to do that's why not many people have done it got you but you have done it, correct? I was lucky enough to do yeah. it. Yes, I what what I would say if I can if I would use the opportunity to tease people uh, a little bit because I will be talking to to this on on this mini series. Uh, there were two of us going in, but there was only me coming out. I was yeah, things happened. Things happened. Man, uh, hear the rest the, of the story the, on Chasing Bando's podcast. Yes. Yeah, uh, sorry, man. Sorry, I, I, I can't help myself. I, I'm, um, I, I wanna... No, I can tell you. I, I can tell you a little bit. I can t give you a short version. Um, uh, um, I was supposed to go with a guy called uh, Josh, who has a he's huge on on YouTube, exploring with Josh. But he basically uh, gave gave up. Um, um, maybe a month or two months before it and we were planning this together and then um, a guy I was so determined to do it because I was training for it and my mind was set on, uh, on doing it so I, I was going there by myself I bought the ticket and a week before this happened a guy would contact me on Instagram and says that he wants to do it and um, and I didn't know this guy and obviously I tend not to explore with strangers but he really wanted to go and on, on top of that i didn't want to be by myself so yeah. he he went with me but he just wasn't ready he didn't do any training he wasn't ready for this physical uh track uh, it was just too much for him um and he damaged his leg and um and eventually like he just wanted to get caught because that was his only way out to uh from that place yeah whoa yeah. It was he. He put me in very, very difficult position. This was um, he was totally not prepared. Man, wow, that is a fantastic teaser, and I will be listening to that episode as well. So sounds like an absolutely <laughs> insane I'm story. Tr I'm trying to get him on the podcast. Like we haven't talked since. Uh, and I'm I, I send him an email and I I send him a message because I. I I found I thought I thought I, I would never be no never be able to uh, to talk to him again. But I recently uh, discovered that somewhere in my notes I had his email. I shot him an email. I, I said I am I had this podcast because but you know I went there in 2018, so I didn't have this podcast okay. at that time. Uh, and and yeah, I'm waiting for a reply. It would be amazing for us to go on the podcast and just like argue this because like I would love that. <laughs> that would be incredible. Yeah. That would yeah. be awesome. So you kind of started this journey at Chernobyl. And for many people, I know a little bit about it, but uh, many people don't know what happened there. Um, so could you kind of explain that? Because I know Chernobyl is definitely huge on the urbex scene as well, but it's also more mainstream. It's totally legal. You have people who can help you get in. Um, mm -hmm. not, not tour guides, but like, you know, researchers who are there and, and can help you explore. Um, but yeah, tell us, do a brief history overview of what happened at Chernobyl. Well, uh, Chernobyl essentially was uh, a, a place where the Chernobyl is like a small village, really, uh, that was originally uh, a dare. So when they pl when the in Soviet Union when they uh, when they planned to build on. Uh, nuclear reactors uh, in that place uh, they called it Chernobyl because that was the closest uh, village to that place but actually what happened is they built a new city called Pripyat and that's the city that you would visit if you go visit um, Chernobyl um, so they built they built a bunch of reactors in there and um, you know um, uh, there were to, to, to it there is not like there's a one way of saying what happened or there's oh you know it, it's it, people say it's a human error versus uh, um, you know faulty equipment but it's a mixture of things those reactors were not really um, 
uh, the way they've been designed, the way the whole thing was built, they were cutting costs, so it, it wasn't the best equipment. Um, the crew was not technically the, um, um, they were a little bit inexperienced. So all of this together, um, they were they were running a test because the people at the top, they needed to fill in some sort of uh, quotas they uh, and they had to report to the others and then if they if they do it uh, fast enough they they can get promotions and stuff so they they planned this test and uh, essentially they were trying to um, um, you know test uh, uh, the, the, this this reactor and, and the test failed and uh, it overheated and and exploded and that's the big difference between like the Fukushima for example, uh, and the Chernobyl is that in Fukushima the reactor didn't explode, so it's not as serious as Chernobyl. Where Chernobyl was, is you, you could call it probably the, um, the like the biggest disaster of, of the 20th century. And essentially, uh, from from one day to the other, the 50,000 50, uh, 50, people. 50,000 people used to live in, in the city of Pripyat and from one day to the other it became a ghost town because they had to evacuate everyone and people left their belongings and everything they were told okay you can bring your suitcase but don't bring anything else because we will come back and obviously no one was allowed to go back yeah but now everything is looted obviously like you won't find a lot of stuff in Chaudhamun now, because through 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 the years, like every has everything has been looted, um, but you can buy uh, an official tour, uh, and you can experience going to Chernobyl with like a guided tour, and they would let you go to the buildings and stuff. Like you're not supposed to, but they still let you do it. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, just the entire story for anybody who wants to hear more about Chernobyl. Uh, just go listen to your um, eight, your ten part series because you go pretty in depth about uh, people's experiences exploring there. And I remember the one one guy I can't remember his name, but he was actually in the control room where everything went oh. south. Yeah, that was that was an incredible episode. Uh, that, that was sad uh, from Italy. Yeah, um, I I, I kind of lost my shit on this one because uh, he blew my mind. Yeah. I, I I honestly like I was hearing um, the stories about uh, like going to, to a reactor because you see the thing is I could not comprehend that that the same building where the reactor exploding exploded that this building, like, you can still go to this building. Like, I mm -hmm. could not comprehend. And, and and then, since then, I realized that when they were building the reactors, they were actually building them in pairs. So one building would have two reactors. So therefore, it would be you would have two control rooms or, like, more control rooms, one control room for one reactor, one control for the other reactor, right? So when this building... Um, when the reactor exploded and the part of the building kind of, you know, uh, collapsed on itself um, and they built this sarcophagus on top of it, I was under impression, all my life I was under the impression that the sarcophagus covers the whole building, but it's actually part of the building and there is another building where there is a, like, just normal reactor there and through the years there are still people working in Pripyat because they are still working on shutting down the reactor. It's not like a light switch, like you don't just turn it off. It takes ages to years to, to actually shut down a nuclear reactor, so that's why people still work there. But now there are some tour operators that could take you to this control room and you can look at this um, AZ5, I think it's called, the button that they pressed originally that caused that, um, that disaster, which is like insane. When he told me, literally, when I was hearing him, I was like, I'm, I'm going. Like I, I made a decision, like already made a decision. I am going there um, because I have to, I have to go there. <laughs> I yeah. have to experience this, uh, being, being in that room. Yeah. And it kind of goes back to like some of the, some of the draw with this urban exploration and visiting abandoned sites is 
just reliving the human experiences that happened in those locations. Uh, what has been kind of the biggest impact for you on a personal, emotional level by visiting all these abandoned places? You know what? I would say that um, my experience is a little bit different to other explorers because I did I did it for a bit of a uh, about a year when I was uh, living in in London and I would be traveling around England and Europe. Uh, but then I moved to China, so uh, a lot of the places that you see are in China or in Asia, and experience here is a little bit different because it's um, people don't tend to care that much about about it, and on top of that. And this is where I'm going with this, is I wasn't able to have the same experiences as some of the people that I interviewed. What I mean by this is like I don't speak the language here. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I, I, I've been here almost three years now. I, I, uh, my Chinese is better than when I started, but it's still pretty basic. So I'm not, um, I'm not able to have conversations if, if I come across someone in there but some of the people that i interviewed they had incredible stories when they meet people who like live in abandoned places and they hear the stories behind why this happens or uh, i interviewed um explorer from from holland that went to georgia country georgia and she met a refugee um who was living in abandoned hotel because of the war between Georgia and Russia. And um, I met um, another uh, explorer, um, I interviewed another explorer who were telling me how they met homeless people or gypsies in Bulgaria, for example. Um, and, and you know, because of those experiences, because they were willing to talk to those peoples and hear their stories, it makes you like appreciate your life so much. It's, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but, you know, like once and when you see someone struggling and then you compare it to your own life, the problems that you have, just they give you perspective. Yeah. And and I, I, I just love hearing th those stories. And I, I just love talking to people who have passion for something. And that, that gives me motivation to do what I do like gives me that drive that I need to I need to go out there I need to do something and you know like what we do is a little bit shady because I didn't mention this before but you know the places that we go to we're not supposed to like they are they are not open and the, the sign says no trespassing it, the sign doesn't say like you're welcome so it is a bit on 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 the edge what what we do, but I feel it's one of those things with, uh, you know, like with a bit of a risk that comes greater reward, and and I think it attracts this certain people who maybe have a little bit of a problem with authority, and and I think naturally very curious people. Um, because, you know, it, it is a different way of spending your, your free time. <laughs> yeah. Is, is there ever like a, I, I don't know how to say this, but like a line that you won't cross if something is, you know, off limits and you decide not to go explore a certain location? Okay. So in terms of the play, the, all the play, I, I want to say the first instinct says no. I, when you ask the question, I want to say no. You find um, a way way to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I find a way to do it. Um, I, I am kind of known for being this person who, like, oh, Greg always manages to, to find a way. But I, am, I, am, I want to say this uh, up front here that um, we in this community, and I would go back to answer eventually your question but i just really feel like this is very important that people need to know because um this happens on a daily basis um there is a code like i i i always tell people even pirates they have it, they had their own code right and in this community i try to promote uh, the, this code and the code says that we don't 
take anything from the places. We or the only thing we we do is we take pictures. Nothing else. You don't take anything. You don't you don't break anything. If there is no way inside, and usually there is a way. Usually there is always some sort of way. But if there is no way inside, you don't damage the property. You don't destroy things. That's not the way. I operate. That's not how how we do it. There's always some sort of creative way that you can manage uh, to get yourself in in there. So that's I want to make that very clear. Now, there is one place called uh, Famagusta, which is in Cyprus. Uh, this is abandoned city that's controlled by the Turkish military. This was the result of the war between the Turkey and Cyprus, and. Um, that place is known like people died in there because the Turkish army shot them. Um, so I would not go there. Um, I mean, I would love to go there. Like, don't get me wrong. I would love to go there because it's like a, a time capsule, right? But, and the place is, you know, abandoned since, since seventies. Um, but it's very, very dangerous to go there. And, um, and you know, I don't, want, I don't, I don't want to die. But uh, so, so what I'm saying is like there is a research that takes place before you go somewhere, right? And you assess the risk. Um, my limits, <laughs> I, 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 you know, so like if there is a military that can shoot you, like I would say, like I, I don't, I don't go there. That's um, your line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, but in terms of other places, I would um, I would risk it. Yeah, you know, like we have one life. You know, like <laughs> like I'm not gonna go back. I'm not. I'm not going back to my previous life. Yeah. You know, like that 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 life I had, I experienced that life, and I wasn't happy. And and believe me, like when I do this now when it's like just a little bit difficult and there is a security on there, maybe there's a dog and you sneak out and you're trying to maneuver and then you're trying to like find your way in, but it's like a bit shady and like there's like, it just, you feel so alive. Oh my God, there's, there's nothing like it. And, and I just, I love it. I love it so much. That's great. You, you are definitely um, addicted to this lifestyle. And I think that's what that's that's what holds people in is it's just like the challenge and just the, you know, finding a way to get in and, and not get caught, which um, I love that about listening to your your podcast. Uh, like you were saying, you do uh, uphold that code talking about not breaking things, not stealing things. And um, some of the guys on your podcast, they're really good at uh, lock picking. So they can like uh, unlock a, a door, get in, take the pictures, and then get out and then lock the door again. And, you know, it, it's basically like it was untouched. Honestly, this is something I would love to have. I would love to have this skill. I just never made an effort yet to, to learn this. But it's like, I, I honestly, it's one of those things when I'm thinking to myself, like, um, how come... I've never tried. Like this is long overdue. I should. I I I know this one guy in in UK that's so amazing. But he explores more of like um, uh, tunnels and old like World War Two or World War One kind of places. And it's just so amazing that he is able to just uh, lock pick, go inside, do his thing. Come he comes out, he locks it, and there's like nothing happened. It's just, it's just, it's amazing. So yeah, I would, I would definitely, uh, would love to have that skill. Yes. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Um, I kind of want to talk about, uh, along this line of thought before we started recording, you were talking about, um, cause you're living in China right now and you're working as a teacher to, um, buy food and pay rent. And then your life is exploring these abandoned places. Um, but you mentioned they kind of had to get you out of trouble a couple times. So what are, what are some experiences that you've, you've been in lately that you'd be willing to share? Yeah. So, 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 you know, I, I, how do I put this? I'm just, I'm just thinking, I just, I'm just, I'm, I'm, 
I'm trying to talk to you, but at the same time, I'm thinking about like, what can I say? What shouldn't I say? Mm, so what I would say is obviously I talked about this being not technically like the, you know, like it's a little bit shady, right? So because of this, it's pretty impossible to not get in some sort of trouble. Now, usually, if you don't explore in America, America is a completely different beast. The trespassing laws are not very serious. And usually what happens is there is a, there is a conversation that happens. When you get caught, you explain yourself. And like most of the time, um, people are okay. They like, obviously they don't get it. Uh, but then you show the pictures, like you, you just, you, you, there's a way of getting yourself out of it. Like that's mostly my, my experience. If I get caught, which I really try not to. And I would say this doesn't happen a lot, but it did happen. <laughs> it did happen. So there are a few times where, um, you know, you end up at the police station. Now, because obviously I live, I live in China, I, <laughs> I would have to have uh, someone to get me out of that. Uh, because even like having someone that would just like translate and communicate and obviously uh, my passport is linked to my visa. My visa is registered with like the education bureau, all that stuff. So very quickly um, they would be able to like find where I work and contact the school. So like, the <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm not technically the most popular teacher in my school, uh, but but yeah, I I'm 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 really trying not to um, not to get in trouble, uh, especially in my province. Like, <laughs> yeah, because yeah. obviously obviously there there sorry, but there is there there are there were play there were um, there were times where I got caught um, in different provinces, but this ended up being like okay, they let me go because I was in different province than my school, and my school doesn't know about that. Um, and one of them was like super serious, <laughs> but, but yeah, but yeah. Yeah. No, I, I was curious, um, more along the lines, like what were you exploring? And if, if you're able to share that story and how it happened, but if you don't want to share that story and if you shouldn't, then that's totally fine as well. No, it's, it's okay. Um, <laughs> there was this one time where, where I, um, this was my first year. And I think it was like, it must have been, I must have been in China for like six months. And when this happened, I honestly thought, wow, Greg, like you, you just came here and this is like the end now. Because I honestly thought this, like when I got caught, it would be my end, like my last day in China. And the reason I thought this it is because I got caught, I got caught flying my drone over a secret military base in China. <laughs> that base is not on the map. That base is not on any map. Uh, you know how, you know, like, so for example, when you, when you have your drone, the drone is connected to obviously like the server, they have their own maps. Um, and the reason for it is because they would put the red zones, for example, uh, no over zones. the airport, right? No yeah. flight zone, right? And very much like that's 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 perfect that that's it that exists because you shouldn't be flying over airports, right? It's super dangerous. Yeah. Now, obviously, there are other places like military bases and stuff, and like for example, Beijing has a huge no flight zone, or or like almost over the whole city. There's no flight zone there. Um, so, uh, it, so when I went <laughs> to that place, there was no red zone on that place. And the reason there was no red zone is because they didn't want to highlight that. Yeah. Because that base doesn't exist. So, <laughs> but honestly, I thought, I thought that I, this was a plain graveyard because when I came across it, um, I thought to myself, wow, 3,000 planes? <laughs> like, this looked like a plane graveyard. 
Yeah. And um, but yeah, they, they got me within two minutes. It was crazy. <laughs> How how'd they find you? Uh, I don't know. I I was flying, and all of a sudden, uh, a guy, uh, a military guy on the motorcycle comes in, and boom! But you know what? It was like this. I, I'm I'm flying this drone, right? And I see, and I see, um, like so many of those planes. So I'm trying to get my drone to the like to the to the like to the beginning of that line, so I can have like this picture, this vertical picture of all of those planes. The whole thing, yeah. But as I'm yeah, as I'm flying this drone, I can like see like, wait, where where is the there is a car driving there, and then all of a sudden I see like the I think I see like a column of soldiers walking, and I'm like, uh, holy shit! I don't think this is abandoned, but by the time I realized, they he the guy was already next to me, and um. And yeah, and yeah, that ended up being a, a, a really long interrogation, <laughs> like really, really <laughs> long. And and the guy that was interrogating me, you know, he didn't have any insignia, nothing. He just had a white shirt, which uh, I was later told Chinese national security. Boy, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy, but but you know what? The thing is, the thing is, they obviously they were very, uh, they were afraid that I was some sort of spy and stuff. Uh, but but obviously, the moment you open my laptop, the moment you open, uh, you look at the SD card on my drone, on my camera, on my phone, you have the abundance of evidence of what I do. So. When I was saying to them, guys, I, I thought this was a plane graveyard. This is what I do. I go to um, those places. Uh, you know, like they could eventually see me. See, uh, they could not not see me. They could eventually see all this evidence on my phone. But you know what? It, like sometimes it's so weird to explain yourself. It's like I um, I I'll give you an example. Let's say. If I was writing a book about, like, like I was writing a crime book where a, a main character kills his wife or something, and then, and then, let's say at the same time my my wife died, and I was writing this book, I would be the main suspect, right? Because I was writing a, a book. By the way, my my ex-wife, she's alive. Okay, <laughs> this is just an example. Just making uh, that clear. But but <laughs> but, but what, what, where I'm going with this is like when you are caught by the military and they say they say. Have you taken pictures of other planes? And I'm like, uh, yeah, I did. Have you taken? Uh, uh, I've taken uh, pictures of other like abandoned planes, tanks, boats. So I have a lot of that stuff. But all of a sudden, in that context, it's so difficult to like explain yourself. And everything that you've done in the past, because of the circumstances, it makes you look suspicious, even if it was like super innocuous. But yeah, it is what it is. But um, ultimately, they believed me, and um, and it was fine. Yeah. But it was scary. Did they make you delete the footage you'd gotten? You know what? It was so funny. It was so funny. I, 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 to this day, I cannot believe that this is actually ha that, that happened. Now, their obviously their problem with me was, and I think that's why maybe this interrogation took so long. Uh, it was like over ten hours. Um, wow. That um, no, I, I believe me. They know more about me than like my parents or my brother. Like they, like they know. They know everything about me. Um, now, they said to me, like, if you knew that this was a plane graveyard, why did you keep, why did you take those four pictures? Sorry, let me, let me again. If you, if you realized that this wasn't a plane graveyard, why did you take those pictures? And it was so hard to explain this to them because, like, when you hold your controller, it's like um, if you hold like an Xbox controller, you have the trigger, you have your uh, f the, the pointy finger, you have it on the trigger, and that's how you take pictures with with the uh, with the Mavic Pro controller as well. Mm -hmm. So like I'm flying at the same time like a pick and I snap and I just my finger yeah. just snaps because you don't you don't fly your drone and 
just like take one picture and and you're done. You take multiple pictures and then you pick one. Like I take 50 pictures and then one works for me. So it was a bit tricky to to explain this. Um, but yeah, wait, what was your question? Did, did they do they require you to delete them? Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Yes. No, that was uh, a great story about it. Uh, so eventually, they um, they they told me um, that they're going to take the SD card, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, but the, at that stage, I got a little bit like I got angry with them because I was like, like guys, like uh, there's literally ninety nine point nine percent on that on that SD card. It has nothing to do with this. I have yeah. so much stuff because I was this was this was I was. I didn't just go there. I was on the road trip. So I've mm. done uh, multiple locations prior to, to this event. So I still, I wasn't home. So all my stuff was still on that SD card. So I was telling them like, guys, like I, there's just so much stuff in here that has nothing to do with, with what this, like I need to take this stuff. And, and they, they, they let me, like they let me copy the, the stuff. So I was like, wow, okay. I, I mean, I was I was saying this, uh, thinking that I have like two percent chances, but yeah. they they did let, yeah, yeah. Nice. Well, at least you, yeah, at least you were able to keep the pictures. <laughs> yeah. What a crazy yeah. experience. So yeah, with all with all the exploring you've done, are there any any others that kind of stand out as, uh, yeah, either really exciting or dangerous? Or meaningful. Oh yeah, how much? How much time do how we have? Uh, right. <laughs> so, uh, so I would say one of the really cool stories is uh, um, in Bulgaria. Um, essentially, what happens is like whenever it is difficult to get inside, whenever there is a security guard, and then you manage to like get there anyway, and outsmart them. And if there's like some sort of physical challenge or there's a, there's a difficulty, that's where I really enjoy that. Um, so in Bulgaria, this is going to sound like a fairy tale. In Bulgaria, on top of the mountain, in the middle of nowhere, there is this huge building that looks like a UFO. It's called Buzluja. And this was a, essentially a monument to the Bulgarian Communist Party back in the day where Bulgaria was a communist country. And it has a significance to Bulgarians because there was some sort of like battle uh, in the past. That's why they built it in that place. And there was like they, they won this battle and they got independence, something like, I can't remember. But um, this place has been abandoned since Bulgaria stopped being communist. And uh, uh, a lot of people would go there and, and it has this amazing dome with this beautiful uh, red and green hammer and the sickle on top of it. And it's it, it just a truly exceptional piece of architecture, this building. Um, you know, the, the communists, they love that stuff. You know, they, <laughs> <laughs> they, they had some good architects, I would say. Um, and and I would say uh, this was one of those super amazing missions because uh, when I went there, it was super windy. I think it was April or March. I went there with another guy from from uh, Bulgaria. And that's one, one thing about like Instagram and the, this community is so amazing that you can link up with other people and just because you guys share this hobby, people are so willing to accommodate you and like people are so nice to me. I just, I don't, I don't get it. Like people like are so super nice. Um, but anyway, let's get back to the story. So I went there, there is a security booth right outside, right? And I was going with this guy and he was telling me how it's pretty much impossible to get in there because um, this guy is there and like, how are we going to do this? You know, there's no, there's no way in. And so like, just, you have to be happy with take, take pictures on, on, off from outside. But I was like, I'm, I'm flying from London. 
you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm going to another country to do this. Like I, I need to make sure there is, uh, you know, any possible way I, I, I can do this. I, I will try to do this. So I started walking around the building and what I've learned very quickly is that when you go to a location, you look for unusual things. You look for things that look different. They, there's something off about them. So I noticed a bunch of stones on the ground and they were clearly different to the rest of the, of the ground. So I walked up to them and I started removing them and there was this like a little bit of a metal plate that you can lift it and there was a hole inside. And I'm like, this is it, like whatever, like I know this is it, like no one would cover this with stones if this wasn't the way in, right? So what we did was pretty amazing. We went to the edge of, of the building just so when the security guys, security guy, when he comes out, he would see us. So my friend, he put a tripod on. He said that he was already caught a couple times there. So he cannot go inside with me because he would like have some sort of record, whatever he was. He was just didn't want to go. So we set up a tripod on the edge and he would stay there and just like have a conversation with me. But I wasn't there. So he was just pretending that he has a conversation with me. But I went around the building, removed the stones, and I went inside, right? So later on, he told me that the security guard, and we were super lucky because it was so cold and windy, security guard would just come out of his booth every like five, 10 minutes. He would see my friend, and then he would be like, oh, they are still here. So then he goes back to his booth, right? Um, in he wouldn't walk around just because he was so cold. So he didn't, yeah, he was like, oh, he, he's still there. Okay, never yeah. mind, I go back. Now, I went inside the hole. Now, what happened is this hole, someone must have like digged this hole. And this hole had, it was just like, I was just like crawling in there dark i had this massive flashlight with me and in front of me there was someone smashed a wall right and this wall uh if you looked inside there was a drop of about three or four meters to the basement so from that hole i managed to jump to that basement now i would tell you later on what happened to my foot but i only realized that afterwards because adrenaline is like adrenaline can do amazing things to you. Mm -hmm. And so I, I managed to get inside this basement and then I would, the uh, part of the metal door, uh, the basement was locked, right? Uh, with that door and, and, but someone like managed to cut like the, piece like a little square on the bottom of that of that door and I managed to crawl through that find my way uh, around this building got to the top and obviously I did my pictures I did my videos and stuff I spent there maybe around 15 minutes and that's another thing about this hobby and photography that we don't really have a lot of time in places like this I think that's mainly that's I think why people uh, appreciate Chernobyl as well because you actually do have time in there but in most of the places you have to go quickly you take your pictures you you go out so I spent around 15 minutes in there I managed to get out getting out was really tricky because obviously when I jumped I jumped right but going out um, climbing a wall that's three meters high it's close to impossible so I just collected pieces of wood uh, from the place and I leaned them against the wall and I saw a piece of metal sticking out from the wall so I managed to to run and jump off those um, wooden planks and and hang like I cut the, the metal piece and I like pull myself up from that and that's how I managed to escape uh, and then when we came uh, when I came out we we packed the tripod and I off we went and we went back to the car, we waved to the security guard and like goodbye. And he didn't even know. He just had no idea that I went inside and that was perfect. And only in the car I realized that like I twisted my foot or this or something like my foot really hurt. 
uh-huh. but you I didn't I didn't hear I didn't feel it at the time because of the adrenaline. Yeah, so that was like one of the awesome places that I've done. And and what is really pleasing is that there are people in Bulgaria who are currently renovating this place. So currently that place is no longer technically abandoned because they are they are trying to bring this this place to life. And this place has this amazing mosaic around uh, around the whole because it's like a it's it's obviously a, a circle. It's like a dome. Uh, so um, this mosaic is is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Wow, what an incredible place! And yeah, the, the adrenaline because you even you know you even jumped off the wood and grabbed on up there and never even noticed it. That's that's absolutely insane. Yeah, because when I was looking down, I actually um, I I didn't notice that. Um, that piece of metal sticking out. I completely missed that somehow. Um, but you know, it's just, it's just one of those, one of those things like you, I think it's, it's sometimes it's a bit tricky when you travel for very long time and to a, to a very remote place, you spend all this time and money to go, go somewhere. I think it gives you that extra motivation to, you know, to actually, to actually do it, you know? Yeah. I think the craziest thing from that story is that you jumped down there without a way to get back. <laughs> have you ever have you ever been um, stuck in a place like you were able to figure it out on that trip? But have you ever been stuck in a place where you you had a lot of trouble figuring out how to get out? So I haven't I haven't been in that situation, you know, knock on wood that I won't be. I was once. I was once in the abandoned theater where I just couldn't find the way to go to the um, to the main like the main part where the seats are, and also to the projector room. And I couldn't find the way in, and I was going to so many different rooms. I was going to like on different different floors. I was trying to get my around uh, my my. Um, uh, around this place and I I was I was lost there because I uh, went to so many different rooms a couple times to the same room but I couldn't um, and I couldn't find my way in eventually I did but I was never in a place where I got just got got locked but it's funny enough because I just recently interviewed an explorer who t- told me who went to the same place the the where the shuttles in Kazakhstan are uh, Kazakhstan are, but he went there before me, and he told me a story where when there were four of them, and when they were in the hangar a, a, a soldier a security guard or whatever he came to in he came inside with like the Kalashnikov on his shoulder, and he just literally stood there for three hours just stood there because you see in that place when you make noise you can hear this 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 you can hear it from everywhere any sort of noise you can hear it and he was just standing there and waiting for someone to make noise and when he left he shouted something to some other guys and they wielded the 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 window that those guys went through they boarded up the window from the outside so those guys get trapped inside a, a, a hangar with abandoned space shuttles and they man, they manage to go to 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 the bottom like to the to the basement and somehow find some sort of window they they pry open or, or, or some other way and they manage to leave that but that must have been super scary oh my goodness i can imagine that's hours of terror mm. Yeah, but I've heard about explorers who who were going to like abandoned asylums and and people come in and they boarded the the windows and so I, I and I've heard I interviewed this guy um, called um, called uh, Bob from Detroit and Fran and they got trapped in uh, in the uh, mental hospital that is just the door. Uh, is one of those doors where you, when you lock it, 
you can't open it. Uh, so uh, sometimes um, I heard about explorers who had to like call, who had to call the police on them on themselves because they got trapped inside and there was no other way outside. So yeah, it does happen. Yeah, that makes for an awkward conversation. <clears throat> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> That's awesome. So I, I try to keep my episodes about an hour. Uh, we could, it sounds like you could tell stories for hours. Um, but what, what's next for you? Um, kind of looking forward, what, uh, you, you have the podcast, you started that back in October. And as we've teased a little bit throughout this conversation, hopefully, uh, people go check it out because you have so many more stories there. Um, but yeah, looking forward, what's, what's your, uh, next big plans with urban exploration? Yeah. So uh, if, if I may, uh, um, in terms of the podcast, I, I sometimes, uh, the, my story will kind of s sneak, sneak, sneak in, sneak, sneak out, sneak in. What's the word? I don't know. Sneak I sometimes in. tell yeah. the story. <laughs> yeah. I sometimes t t tell some of my stories, uh, if the conversation goes that way but mainly it's all about the people that i interview so it's like their stories so that's what you could hear um i'm currently working on on the book called abandoned china it's gonna be your your typical coffee table book when you go to toilet you can grab my book and and, and look for the pictures <laughs> that, that kind of book um so i'm working working on on that currently and i would uh, love to to do some exploring outside China, but obviously with the current uh, situation, it's a little bit, little bit uh, tricky. There is this one big project that I have with another explorer. Um, we, we were, we are talking about um, doing 365 days exploring. So we would want to go around the world and explore for one year. And we're thinking of creating a YouTube channel. He's really big on on TikTok, and I would love to do that. If we're going to do it, I am not sure um, this would happen. If it happens, it would happen when I leave China, which will be in July 2022. Uh, but um, so that's something like kind of like in the future that uh, might might be uh, might be happening. Uh, with um, with other things, you know, like I I I, I keep exploring, um, you know, because we talked uh, throughout the day today. I just came back from location. Uh, I did this abandoned boat that I've been looking for. If you do, if you listen to my podcast from the beginning, you would hear me saying uh, that I've been looking for this like old galleon or abandoned wooden boat. Because there was one time I found a boat like this in Taiwan, and then when I was almost ready to go, I contacted some people in there, and they told me it's been demolished. And it's just like I went from such a high to such a low within one day. And ever since that happened, I've been looking for this boat. And literally last week, um, very lucky, I was able to find it. And when this happens, it's like I act like next weekend I'm going like yeah. I cannot wait. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's awesome. And real quick, uh, yeah. Tell us about your weekend trip, um, in just a couple minutes from the Instagram stories I watched. It's incredible. Like this boat is huge and it's a wooden ship that's still intact or mostly yeah. intact. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This, you see, the thing is. The thing is, I sometimes I feel a little bit guilty because you see when when you make a picture, when you take a picture on you, you take a video, you could sometimes make the place look much more like you could make the place look better, better than, than what it, it actually is. really is. Yeah. So. You see, this place was actually a movie set. So they built this boat for a movie. That's why it's like on the top of the mountain. And there's like Got this, you. there's like a wild, wild west kind of uh, um, buildings like that you would see, like old western buildings on the side. That was going to be my next question. How did they get there? <laughs> 
exactly right exactly i was i was uh, questioning this myself but but you see because i just discovered this place and um we we we, sp we spent some time trying to find it we found it and then i was having the same questions as you were uh, you were having yeah but then when i got there and we talked to the locals and and then we just found out what this is because we didn't know so like i i didn't know what this was until i went there and and yeah and but it was it, it was amazing it was so cold i know i told you this i i underestimated how cold it, it is going to be so i was not dressed for that and obviously we had to go there really early um at 5 a.m just to be alone mm -hmm. and to take that dreamy 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 picture yeah that's awesome well, I love, I love following your Instagram, like all the pictures that you take, uh, you, I know you mentioned at the beginning, you're not an artist, but in a way you are like capturing these scenes is very artistic and, and just, I, I love seeing the exploration that you guys do. So if somebody wanted to follow, yeah, we've talked about your chasing bandos post podcast, but what about if they wanted to see more of your work and the, the things you're up to, how can they, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm 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 Greg Abandoned, so like that's that's the name I'm I'm rolling with. So if people want to see any of the pictures, they need to just look me up on Instagram. Just type Greg Abandoned, and you'll you'll find me. But you know, I would say I would say there are explorers. Um, I know a group uh, of explorers from Hong Kong. They're called HK uh, Urbex, and those guys really are like they preserve history. You know, they focus on abandoned places. Those places are disappearing very much. Um, there is a, a guy I mentioned uh, before on the podcast, uh, Bob from Detroit. His, his Instagram is Detroit Unseen. This guy has been uh, exploring Detroit for 13 years, and he just made a, a documentary about it. And those guys really... That those explorers who kind of like focus on one place and they stay with it, I really, those are I, 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 like a true explorers that I, I really value their work because some of the places, most of the places um, that they, they discover, they no longer there. And so there is this record of that place because of what they've done. And it's truly amazing what those guys are doing. And, and they are a real, like a real inspiration to, to me. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and wrap up this conversation with uh, what I call the rapid fire fact section. I'm just going to ask a bunch of okay. uh, travel questions. Seth, if I can, if I can just before you do this, one, add, add one extra thing. That yeah, absolutely. I always, who, I always try to, uh, um, try to tell this to, uh, in, to, to any audience that I'm, when, if I'm involved in any sort of interview. One thing that people need to know is we don't share locations. So uh, people always ask, where is it? Where is it? And so uh, please don't ask that because the part of this hobby is that you spend all this time to find a location. You have to find this place and then you go there and then you discover this for yourself. And in, in, in Europe, in America, uh, what we very quickly realized that the mo that the places that get destroyed really quickly are those places where like people know about it. In America, it's absolutely crazy. The moment people know about location, there's so many urbex people and so many other 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 people who go to those places. They just get trashed. They just got yeah. de demolished uh, really quickly. And uh, so w w I feel a little bit special about those places, and I don't want them to be destroyed. So I. Like if you ask me for location, I'm just like politely going to ignore you because like I don't want to tell you. Yeah. So just, just I love that. Just that. Yeah, that's that's very good advice. Like just research it, explore it. That's part of the fun. That's that's part of mm. the adventure. Um. Yeah. So the rapid fire facts. We'll just end with this. I'll just say. Um. I'll just ask a bunch of travel related questions, and you can say the first thing that comes to mind. Do you prefer beaches or cities? Cities. What is the worst food that you've ever tried while traveling? In in China, I I, I, I tried like intestines, like ugh. stuff like the meat. Ugh, is ugh, yeah, yeah. 
Do you prefer <laughs> Do you prefer Nikon, Canon, or Sony? Sony, yeah. Seven R four. Do you prefer Do you prefer a group or solo travel? That's a tricky one. I neither a two people. Uh, would that co- Would that be a group? Would you, would you call that, that is, a group? You know, that is a good question because I've noticed when I ask this question, um, people don't really care for the group travel, but they, they don't want to go alone. But like one or two other people that they're really close mm. with or, you know, like with you, even if you don't know them that well, you you have a shared interest and you're very focused on what you're traveling for. Um, yeah, so I might have to add a third option there. But yeah, mm. I like that. Um, what is the What is your favorite airline that you've flown with? I don't, I don't really have one. Like, I don't really. Uh, I just go like, which, which is the cheapest option? <laughs> I love it, <laughs> and that's why I book. Yeah. Yeah. Do you prefer a strict schedule or go with the flow? <sighs> Again, it's a mixture because I like to plan. I, uh, I, my girlfriend will probably be laughing right now, uh, but I, I really love to plan everything. But sometimes you do have to kind of go with the flow. Yeah. Uh, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would you want to live permanently? Wow, that's an amazing question. You see, you see, this is really difficult for me to answer because I, I moved to China and this is like the first time in my life where I don't really have like a big plan or where I'm going to end up. So... If you don't mind, like I'm probably like going to live, like oh yeah, I know Mars. I would love to go to Mars. So like if Elon Musk gives me a ticket, uh, you can go like you can be on the rocket and go to Mars. Uh, you can go. Oh guy, oh, actually, actually, you know there is this Japanese. Uh, see, I don't know when this episode is gonna be out, but uh, I think on the 14th of March there is a deadline to. Um, uh, to submit your application, there's this Japanese millionaire who's going to go to um, to going to Moon, and he wants to take eight people with him. So, like, I'm I'm filling in that question, like I'm filling in that form, like I'm I'm going. Like, if he wants to take me, I, I will go. Yeah, well, there you go. This uh, this episode will be coming out. I'm actually posting it this week, um, so it'll be coming out on the 11th. So you have three days yes. <laughs> to sign up. <laughs> yes. So if you guys, if you wanna, if you wanna go, just look look this app, Japanese Millionaire. I I have a link. I don't even know his name, um, but I sorry. Like hopefully, he, I mean, like I, I would love if he was listening. He's like you know he would get to know me better. But sorry, me mate. Too. Like I, I know we're gonna be best we're gonna be best friends soon. But uh, you know right now I just need to actually you know what I'm lying I know your name I just I'm waiting for you to tell me how to pronounce it because like with the Japanese like man come on yeah so, I so love yeah, yeah. It. pick me please pick me that is awesome um, do you prefer Apple or Android uh, Apple yeah 100% <laughs> and last question this can be as long as you want it to be what makes travel worth it to you personally I think it's those experiences. Um, I go to places where most people don't. And I hate crowds. I hate uh, feeling like someone is taking advantage of me just because I'm somewhere. Um, I don't like people nagging me. Uh, me, Maybe I just don't like people that much, you know? Uh, So uh, being... Experience some, experiencing a place or being somewhere where it's just a little bit more exclusive and unique because it's just you there or you with a friend. Yeah, I just value that so much. And so that's kind of what makes it uh, really special. And I like the effort. I don't like when it's too easy. I like to feel that I... It doesn't have to necessarily be a place where it's difficult to get to or get inside, but maybe it just takes a long time to get there. You have to go through a, lot, a bit of obstacles. But if you, when you make that effort to go somewhere and you are finally there, I think you appreciate it a little bit more. 
Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Greg, for coming on. I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, hearing all your stories today. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, that, it was awesome. It was awesome. I, um, this is one of those things where I feel uh, so passionate about. Um, I tattoo uh, a kind of like a message uh, on my arm uh, in Chinese because I live in China. Um, and it says, I'm, I'm not going to read it in Chinese because I can't. But uh, it says basically, uh, find something you love doing and do that. And I think that's what life is about. And uh, so, yeah, I, I love talking about this stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a yeah. pleasure. Well, I, 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 can, I can definitely see your passion. And man, just sharing that with us has been a privilege. So thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening to this incredible conversation. I hope you enjoyed hearing uh, all about Greg's adventures. Just incredible. This guy has been to places and seen some things um and, and it was a good reminder for me to just like go out and live like don't let negative experiences shape you into a bitter person or just like you're you're stuck to this certain way of life um you can change your life so find out what you're passionate about and go and and pursue that dream so hope you enjoyed it connect with me on social media uh, at travel worth living i'd love to hear your thoughts on this conversation and you can also leave a comment on the video um, telling us what you thought about it be sure and subscribe to our channel and i will see you again next week so thanks again for travel worth living i'm seth sutherland <laughs>